I'd like to thank Saiful, uh, Boston, Deepal, and Radhika for joining this panel on uh, how we can leverage microfinance to bring power to the poor. Uh, today we're going to talk about the role of MFIs in how we bring clean energy access to end users, uh, coming from the perspective of two energy technology providers in GLP and Burn, as well as from two microfinance, I don't think they'll mind me calling them veterans, in, uh, in Seifel and Deepal. And what we want to do is look at the opportunities and the challenges that the MFI and energy sector um, and the partnerships in that sector face and give some insights into the future as well. Uh, we also have Mr. Mung in the audience who was obviously just on the microfinance panel. Uh, WSDS, as you know, is an MFI and an ARC partner under REMP as well. And so I'll, I'll, um, I'll call on him for a bit of a practitioner perspective as well. Uh, we're time limited again. We only have 75 minutes and I feel like there's a lot to cover. So I'm apologizing to the panelists as well that if I'm stricter on time management that I might otherwise be, but we'll, uh, we'll try and get through it all. And then we'd like to have a little Q&A at the end. Also feel free to uh, ask questions throughout. If there's a point that's contentious or you want someone to expand on an issue, just put up your hand and we'll see what we can do. The, this audience really doesn't need any introduction, I think, to energy finance or to traditional microenterprise finance. But I'll just give a very quick summary of where we as ARC think these, these things come together. Uh, it can be provided through uh, MFIs, commercial banks, village groups, or other informal mechanisms, microfinance that is. But the reason for energy providers to work with microfinance institutions range from very obvious to, to less obvious. The most obvious is that MFIs typically have an existing network and the relationships with the very clients in the target segments that in the renewable energy small act, uh, space we're trying to reach. The unelectrified and as I think it was Mitra who said the billion under electrified. Um, they can do this in a lot of ways. They can finance clean energy through loans for income generation, household quality of life, targeted savings, remittances and the like. They can provide end user finance and supply chain finance to stockists. And as we're really focusing on today, partner with local or international renewable energy enterprises to act as distribution channels. So I'm gonna start with my colleague and guru, uh, Saiful, to give a, a, a broader overview of the evolution of the microfinance sector as it crosses over with energy access and what's particularly interesting now. Thank you. Um, I, I must correct that I'm not a guru, I'm still learning. And you put me in veteran, so it's very hard now to learn. <laughs> but I'm still trying to learn uh, both microfinance and energy finance. So first of all, I mean, microfinance, as you probably all of you know that, uh, I, th I think currently they're serving about 150, more than 100, 150 million uh, clients, uh, active clients uh, all over the world. So, um, and most of them are poor and they are also energy poor. And uh, so there is a huge potential for uh, energy uh, finance uh, organizations or energy finance to these people. But, uh, you know, in reality, what we have seen that uh, not uh, those microfinance institutions who started also about uh, 10 years ago, uh, starting uh, microfinance, starting energy finance, uh, you'll see that uh, they had difficulties, except Brahmin Shukti, which uh, Deepal, I will not talk much because you are here. I cannot talk in front of you. Yes, this is the first in experience. But many others had uh, a problem. And uh, I will, what I will do is I will just share uh, two discussions that I had. Uh, one uh, uh, about two years ago with uh, the C, uh, CEO of uh, Bandhan, which is one of the largest uh, MFI in India, which is our arts partner. Um, they have, they're serving right now is 5.4 million clients. And maybe as I'm talking, maybe 5.6, who knows? <laughs> These numbers I can keep up. Um, 
two years ago, and then I'll have another discussion, which is from another uh, giant uh, microfinance institution from Bangladesh. I'll, I'll not say the name, but I'll, I'll discuss two discussions to answer your question. And so first discussion two years ago, when we just started REMP, and I met uh, uh, Mr. Ghosh, and I said, he was asking what you're doing, so I said, this is what I'm doing. And he said, uh, you know, this is really a need of our clients because uh, they're spending a lot of money in kerosene, they're spending a lot of money in uh, firewood, and uh, if we, we can give something that can you know, provide them good electricity so that clients, uh, uh, children can read, you know, that would be great. So I said, why don't you, uh, you're not doing it? And he said, oh, actually, I, I, I tried this. I tried this one of the company, but my, that doesn't work. I said, so what happened? So what happened is they took about 1,000 uh, lanterns and uh, you know, gave a loan and gave it to their clients, but there were problems. Of course, there is, uh, you know, when there's electronics, there's problem, and at that time, the technology was not great, as we all know. But uh, the companies, they could not give the after-sales service. And it was a huge problem for them. And they thought that, no, this doesn't work. And then, of course, after two years, now Bandhan has, as I'm speaking, they will be opening their 16th energy branch. And by the, you know, they have a, they, as uh, William was talking today, that, you know, they uh, start very small pilot and not really keen on numbers. And uh, you know they want to perfect the system. That's what they are doing. But the vision is after uh, five years, they want to reach one million clients. And the potential that they ha think is about three million clients that they can uh, achieve. And also clients and non-clients. So this is their big vision. So that's how microfinance institution th thought that we should not touch it because this doesn't work. And then two years from, from that 2012, they're saying, well, this is, we, can, we can do this. So this is, this is what is happening. Um, another uh, discussion that I had about two weeks ago in Bangladesh, uh, you know, I'm giving all kinds of clues so you'll understand. One of the most efficient microfinance institutions in the world. Uh, you know, I'll not talk anything else. I think people understand. So they, ha they tried uh, about three years ago. Uh, they, they sold about, uh, about 30 or 40,000 lanterns. And uh, they're working with a company they, that they initiated. They brought uh, lanterns from China. But the problem is, after a couple of months, the lantern did not work. And there's no after sale service. So this is basically a very cheap product, looking very nice. I saw the uh, goods actually, very nice looking. So that's the problem, the lack of understanding about technology. So. So what I'm trying to say, that microfinance institution, while there is huge potential, but if you know, microfinance institutions don't know this very well, because they're very good at financing, not good at technology. So they, first of all, they have to understand the technology. They also need to identify uh, good partners. And the partners, they must have the after-sales service and also repair service, those things fixed. Because here what happened is microfinance, which has last mile financing opportunity that they can provide, no problem. This, especially these big giants, they cannot, there's, it's not a problem. But in their both cases, they don't have the after sale service and repair. So in India, for example, uh, you know, if the client you are saying, you are, uh, we are giving you one year warranty, they will say, okay, very good. But what if after one year? They want to know after one year, am I going to get uh, the spare parts? How I'm going to service it? Because I'm not going to throw the $26, $30 lanterns or solar home system. I'm going to throw it after three years. They will so that's important. So I think that's, that's what's important for microfinance. And I see that microfinance institutions are understanding this sector, and they see a huge potential. So if you look, for example, if you look at uh, Bangladesh, there are like 47 uh, uh, organizations, they call it Eat Call Partners, and Deepal Dai, uh, the, his organization is one of them, and Gramin Shukti is one of them. Out of that, at least half of them are microfinance institutions. They are, they are working on this. Uh, and I'll not talk much about it, because Deepal Dai is the here, he will talk. India, for example, 
If you look at the, uh, you know, the energy now, uh, we have Bandhan, which is our partner, and then, uh, you know, and then we have SKS, which is the, we, we all know SKS, very big also in microfinance, and also they entered into um, energy finance in a big way. We also have Gramin Kuta, which, is, which has just signed as our partner, we will, under FWWB, so they're also very interested. We have SKDRP, uh, so they're also, they have an energy portfolio. And then many others, like uh, we already heard from uh, Mang and uh, their VVD, FWW partners. So a lot of what I'm seeing, a lot of microfinance institutions who has burned their hand before, now they can see that it's probably, this is, a, this is an area we can uh, work with. Could you, could you go into a little more detail of what, what a partnership might look like? They're not one size fits all. Uh, provision of after sale service uh, clearly is something that is in the expertise of the uh, energy provider. But there are other things as well, product training, staff training. Could you talk a little bit about how a, whether a credit officer model or having energy loan officers? So in practice, what is it like when a, for example, a Greenlight Planet and a, an MFI come together? So uh, that, that's a good question. Um, what uh, the energy company can do is, first of all, uh, lack of knowledge. Uh, the microfinance institution don't have the knowledge, technical knowledge. So they can help them develop that knowledge. Developing the vision, they can also help them in developing vision. And also, they can help in training their staff, especially in their product, how it works, how it should not be uh, dealt with. And also marketing and uh, you know, uh, also distribution and, uh, uh, and after sales service, as I said earlier, that's the key. And also spare parts. And after the warranty is over, you know, then the, how they will be servicing those units. So th those are very important uh, things that partner should look into. It was Radhika's colleague Arabin to, I think last year in Manila, um, and a, we had a, a, a day-long workshop uh, ran at the microcredit summit on how microfinance and energy partners can, can work together. And he, he said, product may be king, but distribution is God, mm -hmm. remember? And, uh, and that's something that, which the MFI can, can bring as well. But, but some product partners really have their own distribution channels, so that may be a natural segue to, to Radhika here. Um, GLP, as many of you will know, is one of the leading uh, small-scale off-grid solar light manufacturers in the world. Um, several, ARC is product agnostic, but some of our uh, partners have, after looking at the various solar portable lanterns on the market, have gone with uh, GLP's products. So Radhika, could you, could you give us a brief summary of how the company went from inception to where, where you are now, what you've been able to achieve, and, and where? started as a technology company. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Um, we make the Sun King line of portable solar lights. They range from $10 to $40. Um, we entered this space as a technology company. Uh, we made product, uh, raised money to make that product at scale. And when we were ready to start bringing that product to market, we realized great products alone, especially on a shelf, are not going to change the world. And they're not going to help us reach the 2 billion people that we were excited about serving. Um, so we very quickly became a, a technology plus distribution company. Our first market was India. That was where the, um, the research and product development had, um, had started uh, to some extent, uh, along with the university setting in the US. Um, and we were ready to start bringing our products to market, realized there wasn't a great distribution channel that we could throw our lights into and assume that we would reach our target last mile off-grid household customer. So we decided to build our own uh, distribution model, um, and that is uh, about 40% of, of how we operate today. So today we have two core distribution strategies. One is our proprietary, what we call direct to village, uh, last mile distribution model. It's thousands of last mile sales agents that sell Sun King, sort of like how Avon Ladies or Mary Kay distributors sell cosmetic products um, in, in developed markets. Um, that's about half of our business, and it's uh, historically been geographically bound to India. In the rest of the world, which is about 30 countries for us, we sell through a broad network of distribution partners 
uh, and that the profile of the distribution partners ranges from multinationals like Total, uh, large import distribution companies that are operating in one or, or a few countries, to um, very unique, highly effective social enterprises like Solar Sister or Sunny Money um, that are creating uh, innovative ways to reach, to reach last mile customers. Um, today we've sold a, a little north of two and a half million lights. Uh, about half of our market is sub-Saharan Africa, about 40% of it is, is India. 10% is scattered around uh, Latin America and Asia Pacific. So if you're, if you're pushing into a, a new uh, area, what really determines whether you look for an MFI partner or if you go it alone? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, maybe I'll take you back to how we got into working with MFIs, actually. So we started selling our lights in the middle of 2009, and like many companies, saw a great opportunity to partner with MFIs uh, and fell flat <laughs> in doing that, to be honest, for many of the reasons that Saiful mentioned. Um, it's not very easy. A lot of MFIs have been burnt by working with technology partners that didn't have great products, um, the sort of unbranded uh, companies that, that didn't even have an after-sales service offering, um, et cetera. So we'd seen a, a number of attempts to, to kind of combine energy technology with, with an MFI network that hadn't gotten off the ground. And we started knocking on those doors in 2010 um, in India, where the MFI industry had taken a huge hit for regulatory reasons. So we were kind of going uphill twice, um, and, and then finally kind of stopped working with, trying to work with MFIs. We got a little bit lucky in 2012, actually we got very lucky in, in early 2012, uh, as one MFI um, Fullerton approached us and said, we really want to make this work. Um, and it was a great opportunity for us to try to build a model with an MFI. Um, and which happened to work in our case. Um, it, it worked for a number of reasons, but um, Fullerton had had some experience trying to sell energy products, um, but for a number of reasons that had never gotten off the ground. They'd put it to bed and then decide to revisit it when the, the MFI climate um, got a little bit warmer um, in India. So they came to the table with a lot of learnings to share with us, which we didn't actually have. So you know, we thought this could have worked very well. Um, knew it wasn't working, but hadn't really figured out why it wasn't working in previous years. Fulton came to the table at, with a set of demands. He said, we're a financing partner, we're not a sales company. Um, in India, we cannot buy product from you. You have to figure out a way to get product to our customers. Um, you know, we, we really want to make this work, but we have some constraints. If you can figure out how to, how to solve this, um, this is great. Oh, the third demand was you've got to have great quality product. Our name is, is out there. Uh, on the line every time we pitch one of your products or finance one of your products. So if you fail us, um, you fail you know, lots of customers. Um, so we, we worked very closely with them and built a system that's um, thankfully worked really well. We currently sell about 8,000 lights a month through Fullerton's network. Um, and through that experience, and it took us a, a good year and a half, I'd say, to reach that kind of volume, um, we've been able to start working with other MFIs. Um, so now getting back to your question, how do we decide? Um, it's really important for us to know that the MFIs that we're working with are well set up and understand what they're going into um, before we can work with them. So you know, I think they've got to uh, understand their role. We have to understand our role and, and put a program together that allows us to leverage their reach to, you know, in some cases, millions of customers and their ability to finance um, purchase of products um, but we then have to be able to come in, train, uh, you know, train salespeople or loan officers, depending on how we set it up with, with the MFI, um, figure out a way to offer very solid, consistent after-sales service to end customers, um, and make product available on time. And you, you yeah. second someone to the certain MFI partners, right? I mean, Fullerton's right. got a GLP person in-house. Yeah, correct. We, we now work with um, about 15 MFIs um, across, across India. And, and our MFI business has really been well developed in India, not as well developed in other parts of the world. Um, but yeah, in, what we've learned again through Fullerton and successfully replicated as we've been expanding is it's really important um, for us and for our partners to have a dedicated resource on our team that um, understands the challenges that the MFI is uh, running into. It actually can teach them about those challenges before they run into them. Um, and then also you know, be there to, to prevent challenges uh, in, in the future. Yeah. 
And I mean, just on that example, and before we move on, I mean, how much coordination is there between you and, let's say, Fullerton in how you market the products? Obviously, they've got group structures, they've got existing loan offices, which most, if not all, MFIs have. What are the what are the different ways that you discuss with an MFI how to bring the right types of products in front of the right types of people at the right price at the right time? Right. Yeah, um, there's a lot of coordination there. Um, it starts with just training their entire organization on, on how our products work and how to market them effectively, um, how to provide the right after sales service, so how to help troubleshoot uh, with end users. Um, to you know, making sure they understand the process for if there is a faulty product out in the system, how to get it back and make a replacement very quickly. Um, but it's also about how do you set, uh, select the right sorts of products. Um, you know, I think uh, for, for all MFIs, there's ultimately um, also a financial gain here. So they, they want to you know, offer a product that adds a lot of value to, to their customers, to their borrowers, but it's also you know, it has to make sense financially. Um, so we found, and then we know which products customers really want but tend to not be able to afford at, at one go. And, and for us, that's that's been about the $40 product range. So it's our, um, our higher end um, Sun King Pro that charges mobile phones. It's it's really valuable but, it, but a little bit too expensive for most people to you know, pull out $40 at one go. And I think that's where um, MFI is at a lot of value. So yeah, we've been able to help them think through product selection um, just based on, on what we've seen in the market. Yeah. Um, we're very lucky to have a, a leading cook stove company here as well because uh, obviously today's been dominated by solar and there are reasons why uh, I think solar dominates a lot of renewable energy finance discussion. But we've got Boston here from Bern. Um, can, you, can you start by telling us or give us a little bit of a corporate profile of how it started and also the the difference within Bern between the manufacturing and the design lab, which does what? Sure. Um, it's actually an interesting story, and it unfolded much the way Radhika was talking about Greenlight Planet is. We, but, but almost a step further removed, they went from being a product and manufacturing company to distribution. We actually started as a design lab, and um, the idea was that the world didn't have enough good cook stoves that were developed for the exact context of East Af you know. Kenya, urban Kenya, and rural Tanzania, and you know, peri-urban India, and all these specific contexts which cook differently, right? So the idea behind Burn Design Lab, which was founded by my boss and our main founder, Peter Scott, he said, okay, let's set up a place where that'll design stuff for all these unique contexts, and people can come to us, and they can either hire us, or we'll get grants, or whatever. And um, from that experience, one of the biggest projects was with uh, the Paradigm Project, which I don't know if you guys know them or not, but they were, they're a carbon asset developing de developer and distribution company in East Africa and other places too. And um, we had designed as Burn Design Lab this stove called the Gico Poa, which um, was performing great and it was designed to be a locally produced cook stove. Now, what happened was they did a survey and they found all the best manufacturers they could find in Kenya and they chose the second best one as a contract, contract manufacturer and they could produce a maximum of 1,000 stoves a month and 1,000 very bad stoves per month. So the quality was basically, basically you know, not acceptable and also the volumes were very low. So then we went ahead and we said, okay, now we need to actually start a manufacturing company to not only design good products, but let's make the good product that has good design, right? We started Burn Manufacturing and that's when I started. There's a, I'm one of the co-founders of that and there's 10 of us or 11 of us now, um, and spent two years continuing to develop this product, um, putting the package for the factory together, raising money, and um, we had always thought and we had always told our investors that we were going to sell to four, five, or six social, uh, basically, distributors. And um, that's what we honestly believed at the time, and, and when the first stove rolled off the production line in Nairobi, which was 13 months ago, no one was there to buy it. So quickly we were like, okay, we need to learn how to sell these things too. So it was much the same as Radhika's story where we then said, okay, well, whatever it is, we need to learn how to sell these cook stoves. Mm -hmm. And um, so the question, one of the parts of the question was Burn Design Lab versus Burn Manufacturing. Burn Manufacturing was a spun out of Burn Design Lab. So Burn Design Lab is a nonprofit and Burn Manufacturing is a social venture. Um, 
and most of the action now is in burn manufacturing. And Burn Design Lab still exists and does sort of deep R&D for you know, different partners around the world. What was the reason that these social enterprises who said they were going to be in weren't when the time came to it? All of them were based on carbon, right? So they all had a dual sort of functionality where they would deal with carbon and distribution. Uh -huh. And the carbon markets faltered. And of those six, three of them, they don't exist as a company at all anymore. Like they just, they're gone from the earth. Um, and so basically there was a lot of risk in their model and that was inherently a risk in our model too. So um, we really started from there and it took us about six, seven, eight months to figure out what our distribution strategy would be and, um, and develop it. So how's it going so far? How many customers and where? What's the production rate? Can you give us some numbers? Um, we are selling, making and selling 1,200 units a week. Um, so today we sold 490. Just got an email, so that's good. Um, and we're selling as many as we can make. So um, we have 130 distribution partners, and it's mostly in Kenya, and we're expanding to Tanzania slowly. Um, and we'll start a sales and marketing office in Tanzania early next year and then shortly followed by Uganda. Is it a standardized product or is there a range? Right now we just have one product which is called the Jiko Koa and it's a, a premium household cook stove for charcoal users. So nearly all of urban households in East Africa use charcoal to cook. Um, and those are the people who are spending money on a stove so they have to buy some stove they can't use three stones. Um, and they're spending a lot of money on charcoal too. So these, these are the same people who are spending um, you know, a dollar, sometimes two dollars a day on fuel. Um, and, and we purposefully picked this target demographic because the value pr proposition is high. Um, they're spending a lot of their income. Some people are even spending 35 to 50 percent of their entire family budget on fuel. Is, so, that the main, is that the main driver for switching? It's financial, not health related or time or opportunity cost? Exactly. Um, when we speak with customers, we, our salespeople, Set, they pitch money and fuel savings 70% of the time. 25% uh, of the time they talk about usability. So usability would be second behind money. And usability gets down to speed of cooking, speed of lighting, you know, removing ash, um, smoke. And, and um, if, if you actually look at us versus some of, the other, some of our other peers in the, in the industry, the difference and the reason why I feel we've been more successful with our volumes is because we have a stove that is, has a, offers a good user experience, right? So it's fast and it's easier. Um, all the stoves, they all save fuel, you know, some more than others. Um, but there, there aren't any other products that I've seen that offer both a better user experience and um, fuel savings. In contrast to what Radica was talking about, where their partnership is direct and bilateral with an MFI, um, Burn uses intermediaries, use, as I understand it, three predominant channels that touch on the microfinance sector. So could you go through them a bit? I was actually going through it earlier, and there's five. I missed one. Um, so uh, we sell through microenergy credits, which Greenlight Planet also sells through. And I know um, Arc Finance, you guys know them well. And uh, they're basically an intermediary that will sit in an MFI or a bank and somehow figure it out and make it all work. So um, one of our biggest channels now is through Equity Bank, which is uh, one of the, big, the biggest bank in Kenya, um, through M uh, microenergy credits as, a, as an intermediary. And they also work with some other MFIs in Kenya. Um, the second one would be, uh, let's, what order do we want to go into? Um, there is a, a union of SACOs called Cusco, and an intermediary there is um, called Bomasafi. And actually, the first project and the one I'm just talking about now, USAID and Winrock have supported that. So those are have have been developed in partnership, um, and uh, we basically sell through an intermediary who sells through a union of savings and credit cooperatives, which encompasses uh, I don't know, maybe you guys can help us out, but I think it's four million people in Kenya or something. Yeah, over, Some amazing number. Over 1, yeah. Um, and then the third one is um, we sell through, or we're developing a revolving fund as part of, uh, with par in partnership with USAID and Winrock as well through this group called MESP, which is the Micro Energy Micro Enterprise Support 
trust fund, something like that. Um, and uh, we're developing a revolving fund in partnership with them to fund our distributors. And then the fourth one would be we sell to corporations. So we'll sell to a corporation and they'll allow their employees to basically just remove some of the cost off of their paycheck each month. And then the fifth one is Kiva, which we haven't set up yet. Why not just knock on the front door of the MFI, um, even an, un, um, an NBFC, an informal MFI, and say, would you like to sell these for us? So like Radhika was just saying, they house someone in the bank or MFI. And as, as you guys may know, I'm sure you do, um, banks and MFIs uh, can be difficult to deal with, especially coming from um, our perspectives because you know, there is a, a bit of a gap in between what they do and what we do. And there really is a niche where um, someone needs to figure out exactly how best to leverage the, um, the MFI or the bank. And when I say that, I really sort of think about two things, the network that they provide and the financing. Mm. Um, for example, microenergy credits, they house someone in the equity bank headquarters. And equity bank doesn't ever buy or sell either of our products, mm -hmm. right? But they actually make a margin on it. And so, that was something that needed to be carefully negotiated with you know, the bureaucracy that is Equity Bank. Um, and it's only possible because someone was there working day to day, making sure that they created that model that worked exactly right. Are there peculiar, peculiar challenges to cook stoves that you don't get with lanterns or vice versa? I mean, after sales service is presumably less of an issue with cook stoves than it is with most solar products but are there reputational issues or is it harder to get over a stigma? You can answer as well, but um, you know, Greenlight Planet's a, a brand that's been around longer and they've sold many more units. And so I think it's, it's not necessarily lanterns versus cook stoves, but like you know, the brand that Greenlight Planet provides is it's probably easier for a bank or an MFI. They've probably heard of it for several years now. Um, less risk that you know, we're this new wild card or whatever. Mm. So I, I don't think it's, it's product specific, but maybe company spe specific. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if, it's, um, if there's a, well, maybe we don't have enough experience selling stoves through MFIs to, to compare, but um, I think from a product perspective, you need to have solid after sales service plans regardless of, right. of what the product is, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and if you look at um, Equity Bank, the only products that they've sold in the past are Samsung phones. You know, everyone knows a Samsung phone is gonna mm -hmm. is gonna work. It's a reputable brand, where as you know, these new companies they that they're in new markets, new types of products. Yeah. yeah. Um, we have renewable energy finance royalty in the room uh, with Deepal Barua here. Um, I don't want to embarrass him, but I think it's fair to say that he's done uh, more to scale renewable energy finance maybe in the world than anyone else. So. It's a, it's a pleasure to have him here. Um, could you tell us um, as briefly as is reasonable about Grameen Shakti and about Bright Green Energy Foundation and uh, what it is you're doing? And specifically, what is it about Bangladesh that seems to be not always replicable elsewhere. What is this <laughs> confluence of conditions that allow Bangladesh to be market leading? Thank you. Uh, basically, uh, Bangladesh has a lot of people and a small uh, size of the land. If you put the population of the world in the United States, then density may be less than Bangladesh because <laughs> it's a huge. So this is an advantage and also a, a, a challenge also. But uh, the Grameen Bank started, uh, we started in, in my own village. I was a student in economics, so in 19, uh, <clears throat> uh, so eight, 1983. 1976, initially, we got the idea, and 83 uh, became a bank. But in 1996, after 20 years, uh, Grameen Shakti, I was the founding managing director. So at that time, only 15% people have electricity in Bangladesh. 85% no. Right now, uh, government say around 45% people have no electricity, 55 but practically 50%, 50% electricity and 50% uh, grid electricity and 50% no. Uh, but government is say a little bit higher, they say uh, 40, 55%. Uh, basically, we try to do uh, the renewable energy 
three. One is a wind turbine. We imported four wind turbines from Oklahoma. Berg wind power is a, a, a small wind turbine. And then we try uh, solar home system and the biogas plant. But out of these three, we don't have wind speed mass. Uh, we take the help from USAID for technical assistance. And we send, uh, we take one or two engineers, visited Bangladesh, and we train our engineers how to install the wind turbine and then uh, a hybrid system because sometimes we have no wind speed, a hybrid diesel. So it is a, a little bit challenge. And, but the solar home system uh, we install, uh, basically at that time we bought uh, $7 per peak watt, the panel. And the battery, we don't have the deep cycle battery at that time, only car battery, automotive battery use. So, but the cost is very high. So, f first from with Siemens, then BP Solar, even from uh, California, we bought it, uh, panel initially. And then uh, we tried to install the system, and, but nobody understand. Even we recruited engineers, they never did uh, or studied in the solar energy, though electrical engineer. Uh, but to train them, and basically vendors help us to train them also. Uh, so uh, first one or two we try to install, it takes seven, ten visit to a customer because this is very expensive. We cannot uh, pay you back if you install and we can get energy, but we don't like to pay it because it's very expensive. So finally we convince some of the very, uh, I say, well-to-do uh, member in the society, they are a school teacher, or a, they are a union council member, local leaders. So we one or two convince them in the stall, and people are enjoy it. In the middle of the night, there is a light. Everybody coming together and enjoying the television, everything, and the, they are invited us for a dinner. Though we say dinner is a huge cost because we are uh, five, six engineers, and then other people come. It like a, a celebration in 1996. So uh, we install the system, and that is a really. Uh, a kind of a celebration, people enjoying television and the light. So in the middle of nowhere in the village, so, uh, and then some of the people, the uh, renting battery from the long distance, five kilometers, seven kilometers, because they have money to see television. So television is there, but they bring, take battery for two days and bring back the, so there is a demand of battery also there. So, uh, and then we try to uh, gradually, uh, uh, take more customer, but everybody say, no, we cannot upfront cash. So finally, we decided to a six-month loan initially. And then we uh, got a loan from IFC, 750,000 US dollar in 97, 98, then USAID, Bruce McMullen was a good friend, and Ginny George, the country director, uh, US director, he was also very good, so we uh, some help. And then we gradually six-month loan. But demand is gradually growing, then we go for a one year, and then gradually, then the World Bank came up in 2003. So they come up with the idea 120,000 system. In the meantime, we already installed almost 10,000 system with our own money resources. And they came up with the idea grant. So we give you a $90 grant, this must go to the customer. We say no. If you, we build the mechanism without any grant, but if you come with a grant, then it would be distorting the market. So because the expert from the World Bank and the, some of them from India, they know the seven states in India, West Bengal, Assam, Bihar, Odisha, and other. Uh, they have a, uh, so much uh, subsidy because they need to promote. And India is ahead of us. They have a Minister of Renewable Energy, uh, non conversion Energy there, uh, almost 30 years, the ministry. So they are very really, uh, uh, pushing this solar energy for many years ago. But we grew up in an environment we don't have any a grant like this, but uh, finally agree in such a way, $90, uh, $70 would be the, uh, to reduce the cost of the system, and $20 for monitoring and uh, uh, the uh, follow-up. So that was the 10,000 system. So Grameen Shakti, because we experienced, in the meantime we worked, so we took the advantage. 75% system we installed, and there are other NGO, maybe five, six NGO, including Brock and other, so it's growing. Then it was the really financing things came up. The solar home system, in the meantime, we designed different packages, 17 watt, 30 watt, different packages, but not that. Now we have a 10 packages. So from this experience, it is really growing. And then we, from two years and uh, 
two and a half years, three years, then and the number of systems from the, the poor people can buy a smaller system, 20 watt, 15 watt, and then 130 watt. There are 10 varieties. So uh, people want uh, television, even a color, so they can buy a bigger system. The people only uh, $100 system, they can buy a smaller system, they pay only $2 per month. So there are systems available and so is growing. And the, in the meantime, World Bank uh, has a lo lot of financing in different parts of the world, but not so much success. That's the question again. Uh, success, uh, recently I was in Manila, so when we explain the whole thing, everybody say uh, this is successful in Bangladesh, not in other part of the world. I say success should be inspiration, it's not a liabilities. Uh, if you anything we have done it, why don't you look as inspiration, not as a liability? Can you, can you tell us a little bit about how Bright Green Energy Foundation yeah. spun off from Grammy yeah. Shakti and why it's different from yeah, the usual then, uh, then we have a, uh, then a lot of partners came up because the, you see some of them are doing well and then the political pressure, everybody and they, they want more partners. So they, and the it call, uh, the infrastructure development company, they are the uh, intermediary on behalf of the government, but board is government and private, so it's growing. And then uh, World Bank said, we don't have money. We have done it, 120,000, we show the way. Then the, the finally, because of the, uh, they also have budget for the government projects called a REB, Rural Activation Board, but they are not translating seriously. So that money also transferred to the, uh, this solar program. And then the ADB, Asian Development Bank came up, joined and, uh, so, uh, Jai, sorry, uh, the, uh, KFW and uh, GIZ also participated and eventually Islamic Development Bank recently uh, JICA also joined. So this is a big, uh, is growing. The foundation things came up, the Bright Green Foundation. So we try to take the solar energy from the laboratory level to the, at the rural area and financing and the repayment was very good because if you install the system and the maintenance is very important. Uh, after sales services, we give a three years loan and the three years free maintenance, and battery for five years, panel for 20 years, charge control for three years, LED light now is good, uh, three years, so there is a guarantee, everything. And then the uh, customer, we train them, even their women, uh, staff, uh, sorry, uh, we train the customer, sometimes man is very busy, we invite the women as a training, so we give a one day training, so they can maintain the system, still maintenance is there. Uh, so it's growing, and then the, in 2009, the, uh, the uh, government of Abu Dhabi, UAE, they introduced a new award called a Jai Fusion Energy Prize. Someone nominated me, I don't know, but uh, there are 50 countries and finally uh, I got, uh, won the award and the first reward. So they give me a $1.5 million and gold medal. So I thought that it is not only for me, it should be an inspiration. So I create a foundation called Bright Green Energy Foundation. The, my mission, how to create Bangladesh as a first solar nation. So I organized Bangladesh Solar and Renewable Energy Association. I became the president. And after two years, I have been re-elected. And then legally, I cannot be again candidate for the next year. So uh, now I'm trying to motivate the government also. Government would draw tax and bad from the solar energy. And they also even prime minister installed the solar panel in, the, in, his, in her office and also central bank. And central bank also introduced a green energy loan. So now we are trying to convince the government uh, uh, the, also in the urban area. Uh, recently, government decided to have a 3% of the lighting demand from the solar panel. But there is a battery. So we are now convincing, trying to convince the government if the, uh, not exactly feed-in tariff, every, uh, in my office, new office, 3 kilowatt we have installed, we just transferring to the grid line. But I don't, I cannot sell it because there is no law. So we are asking for a law so that every house 3 kilowatt, 5 kilowatt in the urban area, that can be transferred to the grid line, and they can buy. Uh, Germany is, you know, the uh, very good example. Even in 26 June, they are producing 73 percent of the electricity from the solar in there. So, but in Bangladesh, in a plenty of sunshine, 365 days, 340 days, you have a sunshine. In that case, uh, we can transfer all this to the, in the uh, electricity, and government can pay the cost of electricity per kilowatt hour they are producing is 18 taka. I would talk, say, can yeah. we talk about the government a bit more? You mentioned IDCO, and I don't know how well people in the audience know the important role that IDCO's played, but could you just describe them and also give the kind of numbers? Um, Nikki mentioned earlier 20 million a month now. So could you give an overview of just how big 
the solar finance market in Bangladesh is? Yeah, because of the time I'm moving fast, that's why. Uh, I think the eat call playing a very important role. Because just with Gramin Shakti, we install 10,000 system, it takes five, seven years, gradually, gradually. But eat call came up when the gum, uh, World Bank came up with the idea solar home system because they are doing in Sri Lanka, they are doing in Nepal, they are doing in other countries. So uh, as is everywhere in uh, Sark region, why not in Bangladesh? So they decided to Bangladesh to do something. But they don't find any good uh, organization how they can throw their money through media or intermediaries. So finally, it's called Infrastructure Development Company Limited. They are for the big infrastructure, roads, bridges, and other things, but not for a, a small solar home system. Finally, because of the CEO, is very nice, he's in a, uh, 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 very proactive. So he uh, also agreed, then we push it, that this organization is very fresh, new, there is no record of any corruption or anything. So finally, uh, because LGD was there, local government engineering department. They're also good, but this one new and they have fresh record. So everybody, and we push it, and finally, uh, it could become a, the, uh, the uh, intermediary. Government sign agreement with the, uh, all the uh, international organization. You know, any uh, international law goes through the government. So uh, sign it and they, uh, send, give the money to the it call. Uh, so government give us a 1% or 2% interest rate, but it call give us a 6% interest rate and 7%, 8% interest rate, different size of the loan. So then uh, it's growing and every year the uh, newspaper broadcast and the competition and new partner they take it so out of 50 now 47 is running different sizes so uh, around 60,000 system per month in installation every month is goes up to 80,000 also that depends upon the dry season and good season so minimum uh, 60,000 around so so far 3.5 million system already installed and every month 60,000 in that calculation because 75 percent if a new organization they get 85 percent uh, then the old organization like us, three to four years, they get only 75%, 70%. So gradually, the uh, refinancing, we install the system and we uh, apply for a refinance, the number of systems and through a software. And then the, uh, it called uh, uh, office field offices there. And they go and check the system at, at least 25%, maybe sometimes 50% they check and they come up and then check it and then finally reimburse. So we have 25% stock and 75% they are paying. But the grant things gradually withdraw without. So only now, uh, only smaller system, poor people can buy it. So after 20 watt, they get a $20 grant because the price is very competitive. All 47 partners are fighting each other, so they reduce the price. So this, because they consider $20, they'll get it. At the, after two months or three months because of the refinancing, so they reduce the cost. Because yeah, now we, uh, Argo finally 30 watt also accepted because after uh, 30 watt is gone, then 40 watt, 50 watt, all these big uh, uh, panel sizes or watt uh, packages are not allowed for the uh, subsidy, only for a loan. So I think uh, it's growing. And now uh, it call, we are doing not only solar home system, biogas plant also, and improve cooker stoves also then recently for last two years we are doing a uh, solar irrigation pump already 100 system already installed there and then we have a mini grid we are working hard on that and the association we are trying to convince the government there are millions uh, shallow tubal pumping water from the underground and also the uh, uh, surface water uh, for irrigation so in the dry season all electricity goes to rural area in the urban area we have a low shedding no supply evening. So now the solar pump, we would like to push in government agriculture ministry so that they gradually withdraw all diesel engine, it goes to the solar pump. Deepal, uh, I'm going to have to move on if that's so. Yeah. We could, we'd love to hear you talk for an hour on that, but I want to cover a couple more points and we are time limited. Um, one, clearly one important type of support comes from the top down, a public private partnership like IDCO is, can incubate a sector or, or catalyze it so much faster. Then there's the kind of support that an MFI will get from its product partner. So I'd, need, I'd like to ask Radhika, beyond the, uh, what we talked about, about having someone in a large MFI, what are the other ways that you feel product partners can support um, uh, the, the um, the, the MFI partner like product training, marketing, et cetera. I know that you do a 45-day credit facility. 
So if you could talk about that. And then I'm going to ask Saiful about the other type of support that comes from things like Apex organizations that you have uh, a lot of experience in. So as briefly as we can, what, are, what do they all have in common? Sure. Um, I think on the front end, getting the logistics right uh, to make sure that the MFI has product available. So they play a great role for us. They add a ton of value in marketing our products and signing up customers. Um, they don't actually sell the products, but they market them, and then either a local distributor or, or a local entity will sell the product. If we don't have product available, ready to go, when they've, when they've you know, built up that demand, um, we're a huge liability uh, for the MFI. So um, it's really important for us to make sure that we're working with the local distributor, logistics companies, the MFI, the team that's going out and marketing the products to make sure products are available and available consistently on time. Uh, that, that's one huge thing. And, and the same thing goes to, I spoke a little bit before about after sales. So um, we've got to make sure that there's a, a timely system that will reliably, consistently get faulty product back from the customer through the MFI channel back to the distributor uh, and, and make replacements on a, on a timely basis. Um, and then the other is product training. Uh, this whole partnership is only as good as um, the people that are going out in the field are at marketing our products. And they've got to be you know, well versed in um, understanding how to speak to the customers, the value that um, products like ours can have to the customer. And it's really important um, that they're not overselling or overpromising, um, you know, and, uh, and creating false expectations from from the customer, uh, from the customer's perspective, yeah. Uh, about Apex, uh, what role they play? I think they play a very important role because uh, when when there's a new technology, new product, uh, traditional banks they don't want to put their money at first. As uh, I think uh, it was Jacob who was saying that you know investors they want to see that whether others are investing in it. Similarly, banks also want to see which other banks has invested in this uh, product. So Apex plays a very important ro role in, in energy finance. Uh, I can give an example of uh, Mang is here. Uh, They're partner of FWWB, which is in India, and our partner also. They are, um, uh, you know, they're working with uh, about seven or eight uh, energy companies, microfinance, who are doing energy. And nobody financed them. And it is uh, FWWB, who actually put the first money, not a huge amount, but you know they started that finance. Uh, so that's, they played a very important role. Um, and also, I think, uh, technical assistance sometimes. Like, you know, we provide technical assistance to, uh, you know, FWW partners, uh, even Utkarsh, actually, which is, a, which is a tier, almost tier one organization. We are giving TA through FWWB. So TA is important. And it can come from Apex institution as well, maybe in a different way. So first is first financing is important. And then second is TA, that is also. So Apex plays those important roles. And in India, we have uh, Millup, which I should definitely talk. They're also uh, you know, Apex institution, which is our partner as well. Uh, and the OQ Credit, which has uh, also um, uh, their funding energy, in, uh, in addition to their microfinance. And all of them, what I have seen in their portfolio, almost like four to five percent of their total portfolio is going in energy finance, and is growing. So I think that's the important part. As they grow this, and I think banks one day will see that actually this is interesting uh, financing option and it's commercially viable. And then I think they will come we the mainstream. Yeah, the and that's when they actually will see what we have. Microfinance institutions they don't take actually phone calls on March uh, in India. That will happen, I think, I think I would, I would say, yeah. soon, uh, that, five will, to six years, maybe. Will that mean that Apex organizations will become obsolete within energy finance in a I, I don't or? think so. I mean, if you look at FWWB or OQ Credit or uh, Millap or, uh, you know, in case of Bangladesh, PKSF or in Philippines and, or any, any other, uh, you know, you'll see that uh, still there are uh, these Apex institutions and still they're playing a very important role. Uh, because uh, financing, different kind of financing is necessary. And microfinance institutions, they don't want to put all their, they don't want to take everything from one bank or from one kind of institution. They want to diversify their portfolio. So that's why still FWWB, which is uh, the cost of money is high, still is very relevant um, for uh, many institutions, especially medium to, uh, uh, you know, medium size or 
uh, small yeah. MFIs who cannot directly raise fund, uh, not necessarily the way uh, you know big institution can raise fund. So it's it will be relevant always, I think. Well, as you mentioned, we've got a t a, a, a lower tier MFI WSDS, one of our partners under at the USAID-funded rent program, and Mr. Mung, who was here on the previous panel. So I'd like to ask you, could we get a mic over there, if that's all right? <clears throat> um, if you could just talk a little bit about your energy finance experience so far. I mean, you mentioned earlier that it went through a previous portable lantern iteration, now really a, a, a growing home system program. What, what have been the hardest challenges as a small MFI trying to get into the space. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah, I feel uh, I've just jot down three, four points as the hardest or the biggest challenges. Organization, organize, organizational reputation is also something which uh, is very crucial to make this energy program a success. And uh, number two is uh, understanding the customer's requirement through interaction, uh, through visits, and maybe from, uh, from the feedbacks from the staff, frontline staff who are w working in the field. And of course, choosing the right product I'm writing like this because uh, our experience says that uh, before, now we have, uh, we are tying up with our local uh, uh, local vendor. Uh, previously, we tied up with uh, one Hyderabad-based uh, company, which was, uh, I mean, to reach the product to Manipur, where we are working, it takes around one month. Mm -hmm. And so th the after-sales service was a big issue, and organizational reputation was also at risk most of the time. So now tying up with this local uh, vendor, local integrator, I mean, we are able to um, serve the customer much better and after sales service is also improving much. And lastly, of course, the greatest hurdle is always finance. <laughs> <laughs> and capital, capital uh, I mean, requirement and finance is something which is the biggest challenge. I think that's, that's what I can say about the challenges that we face. Thanks. The, I mean, finance is something or lack of, lack of access to appropriate duration and uh, cheap capital is something we hear a lot at our partners meeting that we had uh, several weeks ago in India and many of the people in this room had had joined us there and sort of the the, the difficulty in tapping long tenor cheap uh, working capital was a was a regular theme um, beyond that and trust which about the, the need for trust between client and MFI and between MFI and energy partner. What are the, can I ask each of you for, let's say, an example of what are the most important things that are going to lead to a divergence between success and failure when you have an energy provider partnering with an MFI beyond money and trust? I didn't actually prepare them for that question, so that's why they're all. Um, let's start with Deepa, if that's okay. I think the uh, from our experience knowledge, uh, any product you come up with, uh, uh, financing is not only the issue, but I I, I believe it is a, a economic model important whether it is sustainable or not. Number two, uh, technology also whether it will work or not. If uh, light is not there television is not uh, running and the mobile phone is not charging, people are not going to pay. So I think the most important in the morning session also, our uh, panelists mentioned that if the on credit, uh, uh, people believe that you give a good uh, quality product because unless they are not going to pay. And the social model, even in the mini grid we discuss whether the people are going to pay or not. So whether the willingness to pay. So uh, these are the three things I think important. And microfinance institution, they are really knowledgeable uh, lending money and bring back the collection of the money and the, uh, uh, the handling the uh, customers, their needs is OK. But this is different. This is different means you have a solar home system or solar lantern, everyone mentioning the after services. So 
you need to, if you are institution or organization, uh, you need a capacity to take the delivery from the supplier also, unless you don't understand what you are getting. So even we so recently we received the LED, but once you give the LED, uh, the television you are running and then there is a, a kind of hazy. So we found out that EMI, uh, electromagnetic uh, interference, so you have to EMI free. So this institution you need uh, some technical knowledge to understand what you are taking. So if you are a company, if you like a, take a software from a company, so you have need to understand what kind of software. So this is also important capacity building at the uh, MFI level and that's why I always recommend if the same head microfinance and running the uh, uh, energy window also, it can be done, the knowledge can be done, but you need a separate window, separate manpower so that it have a, a separate orientation so that it's not because you are not supplying equipment only to the microcredit borrower. You are supplying to the whole section of the society. Otherwise, you not, may not be profitable because the people can pay and they don't have energy. So you are supplying energy to all the uh, sections of the village, not only poor people. So poor people also included. So in that case, I think uh, this is also a, a capacity both in the institution wise and the uh, training and, uh, and material, everything is a part Thank of the whole. Yeah, go ahead. So I think uh, you know one of the most important thing is what we are seeing uh, with our partners is uh, awareness building at the client level because here uh, you know what clients know even if they don't have electricity or maybe limited electricity they know that you know you can turn off your light you can watch TV you can watch India Sri Lanka match or India Pakistan match and you forget about uh, the charge and when the ch charge control is blinking red light. You say, okay, turn off, take it out uh, from the charge control and put it directly to the battery, we can watch. So this is, the expectation is, when I have electricity, it should be there for 24 hours. Or even uh, like a green light planet light or barefoot, uh, you know, we, we will, we ensure, it's, it's like we have the light, so it will go forever. But we are not charging it, we are not cleaning it, and we can, why not, we can put in this, uh, there is a port where you can charge cell phone, so why don't we charge a radio, and why don't we just this? And then I have seen that actually with that charger, they have multiple charger, they charge other things. So uh, I think awareness is very important, otherwise this technology will not work. So that's, I think, one of the success, uh, important thing that, that... That doesn't apply to cook stoves, the charging issue, Boston, but what have you, so specifically in your space, what makes it work and what not? I think um, flexibility of both partners, both from the MFI side and the product provider side. So again, with this program with Equity Bank in Kenya, um, you know, they had to be willing to make their loan process much easier and s make much smaller loans. So they're making $40 loans instead of, you know, they'd much prefer to make $300 loans or whatever it is. And their original uh, loan application was eight pages and they were willing to pare that down to one page. Instead of two weeks, it's one day. So there were serious concessions made on their side and flexibility. And again, on our side, we deliver to them. We stock it at some little pharmacy next door or whatever it might be. Um, we're flexible with, uh, with them and how they want to display our products and things like that. So both sides really need to be flexible and just make the unique dynamic work because it's always going to be different. Mm -hmm. And right, I would last add one, yeah. one little point to that. It's important for us as the energy provider to make sure we continue to stay top of mind for the MFI. So we have to be very hands on. You can't take your foot off the gas pedal because as soon as you do, the MFI's core business is not selling our products. Um, it works really well as long as the system flows, but they have a million other things and a lot of other people knocking at their door. So as long as we continue to stay integrated and stay conscious of what's important to them and making sure that we're helping them hit their goals of growth, new customer acquisition, new borrower acquisition, et cetera, um, we will continue to be part of their programs.